If you've not done so already, it is recommended that you first view part one of the series which is found on our webinar on demand page. We will spend minimal time discussing the fundamental concepts covered previously. It is also suggested that the listener consult these two references for a thorough explanation of chemometric concepts. First, Chemometric Techniques for Quantitative Analysis by Kramer, and second, Chemometrics, a Practical Guide by Beebe, Pell, and C. Schultz. This webinar is intended to answer the following questions. 1. Why is a partial least squares calibration useful? 2. What data do we need in order to produce the calibration? And 3. How do we get to a real-time quantitative trend? Why is a partial least squares calibration useful? In many cases, a concentration of interest can be trended directly from a single peak or perhaps a peak reference to a baseline point. On the other hand, there are chemical and biological systems where absorbance information regarding component concentrations or even physical properties of interest are overlapped and not accessible via direct absorbance trending. In cases where a univariate trend or even a ratio of trends cannot describe the concentration profile, multivariate algorithms such as PLS are very useful. What are some of the concentrations or properties of interest that one might trend using a spectroscopic tool? In a small molecule synthesis system, you might look for concentration of starting material and polymer synthesis, viscosity, Fermentation we will discuss further, crystallization supersaturation, degree of supersaturation, solvent exchange, the concentration of solvents, sparging the reaction mass, concentration of hazardous or impurity forming dissolved gases. With the right calibration data, what can we quantitate using FTIR, specifically in a fermentation? The carbon source, which is typically a sugar, such as glucose, maltose, or dextrose. Amino acids, metabolites, byproducts, and products. Alcohols, such as ethanol, methanol, and butanol. Ammonia, acetic acid, lactic acid proteins and peptides. In the fermentation discussed here, ethanol was monitored. Ethanol plays a role in converting glucose to the final product in this fermentation system. What data do we need in order to produce the calibration? Quantitative calibrations require an investment of time in the beginning, but pay off when we measure concentrations for months or even years using the calibration. For the present case, the calibration standards were only used to predict concentration on the fermentation run from which they were taken. In an actual implementation, a model built from calibration standards taken from one or more separate fermentations would be used to predict the concentration for subsequent fermentations. Because of this investment in time in order to, de to develop the PLS model, quantitative spectroscopy is usually confined to situations where the process will be repeated many times. For instance, a commercial scale process that is run frequently for several years is an excellent candidate for this methodology. Situations where reactions are won one to two times only before moving to the next set of conditions or reagents are usually not good candidates. Here's an example of data that is used to develop a calibration. Plot A is a three-dimensional surface plot reversed with respect to time showing a fermentation. Plot B shows some of the spectral data in a two-dimensional format. Next we will take a short terminology break to explain how spectral and numerical data is paired to build the calibration. Next we'll talk about the spectral data block and the numerical data block. The spectral data block is absorbance data plotted against wave number. The numerical data block comes from either an offline technique or from samples that were weighed out. Together these two data blocks are used to compute the calibration.
Let's take a closer look at the surface plot. This plot shows fermentation with decreasing glucose peaks and at first increasing and then finally decreasing ethanol peaks. In order to see the data better, we will view from back to front with respect to time. Now we see spectra from the same process in a two-dimensional view. In the present case, we were able to create a real-time quantitative trend by taking the appropriate spectra paired with numbers from a referee technique. The calibration standards are shown here. During the first 40 hours of the fermentation, approximately 800 infrared spectra were collected. For about 80 of these, we had numbers from a referee technique. So about 10% of the data was used for calibration. The remaining 90% is used as test data. In an actual implementation, the calibration would then be tested on subsequent runs to ensure the calibration standards are representative. If the model worked for the tests, then it could be put into service and used for as long as possible. Usually a calibration is used for months or in some cases years. During this time, it is periodically tested to see if maintenance is needed. Usually maintenance requires that you will add or substitute new calibration standards or correction factors to keep the model working properly. Now we show the results of the calibration, measuring the ethanol concentration over a 40 hour period. Measurements were made every three minutes for 40 hours. It will be clear from the next plot that the model predicts concentration on the 90% of the data that was not included in the calibration set. The accuracy was found to be approximately plus or minus 0.2 grams per liter. The concentration trend produced from infrared on top agrees well with the referee method on the bottom plot. The accuracy of the infrared concentration prediction as was stated is about plus or minus 0.2 grams per liter. The details of the factor analysis used to perform the calibration are shown here. IC quant was set to auto select the number of factors. We will discuss all the details of this screenshot in a future webinar, but I would like to point out now that the value of RMS ECV, which is the root mean square error of cross validation, is 0 0.242 grams per liter. This is consistent with the approximate 0.2 gram per liter error that we were able to pick out visually looking at the ethanol concentration versus time plot. What is the RMS ECV? The equation above shows that it is just a way of expressing the average error. The error for each calibration standard in the cross validation is calculated by first removing the standard from the model and then next computing the calibration without that standard. Finally, the concentration of the left out standard is predicted. I should point out that the model is not completely validated until it, it is used to predict concentrations on future process runs. The cross validation is the beginning of the validation process, not the end. Now we show the plot for the cross validation. The approximate 0 0.2 error is consistent over the entire concentration range. Future webinar details. Future webinars on this topic will include mean centering, predicted residual error sum of squares or press, which is used for choosing the best number of factors for calibration, viewing factors as projections onto the wave number versus absorbance plot, choosing the correct spectra for the calibration, the Mahalanobis distance, and the residual or F-test. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion on the exciting and useful topic of factor analysis. We would be delighted to hear your comments and questions. Thank you.